January 4th, 2021. Happy New Year, Dell Razors. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you had a safe and healthy New Year's weekend. Here we are. We are here on a Monday, and the holidays are over. It's a new year, and we keep pushing forward. Thanks for joining me. Like always, I, uh, I can't do it without you. That's the honest truth, and I love doing the show for all of you. We have a fantastic guest today. When I say we, it's just me. This is a one-man show. And uh, I know you're going to enjoy this. My guest today is the director of the brand new John Belushi documentary called Belushi on Showtime. And it was directed by R.J. Cutler. Fantastic guest. And he has made an amazing film. I haven't really talked about it much. I talk about it once in a while when people are asking me about why you got into comedy, how you got into comedy, what made you want to do comedy. And when I think back to it, there's so much comedy in my life growing up. All in the family, Chico and the man, Sanford and son, Caddyshack. It's just, it's, it's nonstop. Johnny Carson Show, Jonathan Winters, Bob Newhart, Carol Burnett, Rhoda, Three's Company. Just, just a fucking gamut of comedy growing up. And of course, the major comedians that I've talked about over and over. I actually kind of thought about it over the last couple nights. I've consumed massive amounts of comedy growing up but nobody really had an impact on me early on like John Belushi and there was a time and this is the honest truth I did not know how to go about it but there was a time where I thought man I want to be on Saturday Night Live I'm talking about sixth grade uh, seventh grade, eighth grade. I am just obsessed with the not ready for prime time players. Garrett Morris, who I did a film with, uh, 11 years, 12, 13 years ago. I don't know. John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, big time Bill Murray. And, um, uh, Gilda Radner. Gilda Radner was just unbelievable to me. These people were outlaws. They seemed like they were just, I I don't know. They were just the ultimate artist to me. I was like, what is this? And it really opened my mind early on in life of like, wow, this is This is kind of cool. I don't know anybody that does anything like this. Where do you do this? How do you do this? And of course, you know, you want to do something, but you're you're afraid. You have no idea how to do it. Yeah, I'm in the sixth grade. I don't know. I don't know how to do sketch. Nowadays, you just YouTube, find out, go to a sketch summer camp get a iPhone, shoot some sketches, put them on your YouTube channel. But back then, New York City was 3,000 miles away from the Bay Area, but it might as well have been a million. I'd never been to New York. Uh, I didn't know anything about New York except for the Sweat Hogs and Saturday Night Fever and SNL. And those three things made me want to be in New York City forever. Even the film Taxi Driver later on. Belushi is monumental to me. Every time I drive by the Chateau Marmont on the way to the comedy store, every night I would think of Belushi. Every night I drive by that damn hotel where he uh, OD'd and I think, damn, John Belushi. Anyway, uh, it was uh, an honor to talk to R.J. Cutler. He has made some incredible films, and he's got a Billie Eilish uh, film coming out soon. 
in February, and I'll look forward to talking to him about that also. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Coming to you from Los Angeles, California, where I do live, where I constantly answer emails and DMs each day. Are you going to move? Are you going to move? And my answer to that is no, not, I I don't have any intentions of moving. And it's pretty funny because, um, you know, it's mostly comes from uh, a political flavor that I can feel in the contents. It's, uh, you know, yeah, why don't you get the fuck out of there? Those dim, dim or whatever they fucking libutards. I put up something very, very, uh, something that was very dear to me that happened yesterday. I got notice that the 101 Cafe had closed for good. Another uh, COVID tragedy. And I posted it up. It, it, was, it, it, it hit me because the 101 Cafe was a place that I ate for 15 years. I lived right up the street from it. And I would go every day. And it was my family. When I moved to L.A., I was kind of didn't know a lot of people. Uh, you're kind of lost. You're in a new city. And I would start going there. And the manager, the GM there, Danny, we started, we started talking, we hit it off, and we became incredible friends. Going to tons of concerts together over the years at the Hollywood Bowl. We went and saw Rage Against the Machine together at the Hollywood Palladium. We laughed our asses off. He came to my early on comedy uh, shows. It was so funny. He'd just go, you're, you're funny up there, fucking, fucking asshole, you know? Uh, I spent many, many nights in there with all my comedian friends, Steve Henry and I in there nightly trying to figure out how to get funny, how to get into the game. And uh, it, 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 it meant a lot to me, this place. So when I posted that it closed, I started just getting all this negative stuff from people. Not, not a lot. But enough to be like, what the fuck, man? And it was basically like, yeah, you fucking libertards, you fucking, yeah, Gavin Newsom, you fucking, you're gonna sink with the ship. Why don't you get the fuck out of there? Your fucking virus is fake, fucking everything. And it's just, it made me realize it's like, you know, this is where I'm from. I am from California. And when things get fucking hard, you don't run away. You know, like when I walked onto the uh, patio at the comedy store and people were just ripping me apart, I didn't just, I'm out of here. This is hard. I'm going to fucking stay and figure it out, you know? And everybody that shits on California, it's interesting. They're the same people that'll watch TV and films every night that are made in this town. And a lot of people that listen to this podcast will know about 70% of the people on the podcast live in Los Angeles or in California. And it, it, it seems to me that these negative thoughts on California, and look, it is fucking bad and I've ripped on it many times. Uh, but other places are shitty too. You know what I'm saying? I've been places and I was like, oh, this is shitty too. So the flavor of it to me almost seems like a lot of people that didn't go for their dreams and now this is their time to kick people while they're down. You know, they've always been like, fuck, people actually moved out to LA and slept on a fucking floor and starved and, and learned to craft and, and went for it. Fuck those people. 
Uh, I don't know where this type of thing's coming. It could be, of course, Republican, Democrat, all that shit. But, but to be that small and just to reach out and be like, yeah, fucking blah, 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 when people have lost their jobs and uh, a, a, a 20 plus, 20, 30 year business is gone, just no sympathy at all. Just blaming two, three people in the state, thinking the virus is fake, all that. It's, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. And it's not the type of, uh, not the type of flavor that I, uh, I need. I'm into positive shit, man. And, uh, if you're not into that, you know, why comment? Just talk to your friends. You know, go fucking hang out with your friends and be like, fuck all those guys. It's not a it's not a sporting event. It's not the Raiders versus the Dallas Cowboys. These are people's lives. And uh, you know what, man? It's not cool. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. However you take it is uh, how you take it. But just know that some of your favorite people live in California. And they've got families and they dig it. It's, it's not that easy just to just move out of here. Like a lot of people don't have that kind of money. Just let's just start over someplace where no one knows us and we have no jobs or anything. That makes sense. All right, let's get into it. I do want to thank everybody that was uh, on my Patreon all 2020. I love all of you. I posted up my top 10 records for 2020 on the Patreon bonus episode, and we had a great Zoom fest. I want to thank the brand new Patreoners, Adam.Just. No, it's just Adam. (laughs) Uh, Adam, thank you for bumping it up. Andy... Google Mo, Anna Banana, John Horback, and Gail Glennie Burke. Thank you for joining the Patreon and thank all of you for tuning in every week. Don't forget, Wednesday is a brand new episode of The Grail, my second podcast. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes and tell a friend. And don't forget about my YouTube channel. Right now, let's light the candles up for my guest, Mr. R.J. Cutler. How's it going? All is good. Just busy, busy. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, are we on? Are we recording? Are we, is this the cat? Is this it? Oh, shit. This is it. Here we go. (laughs) Wait, hold on. No one said start. No one said start. Let me slate. (laughs) Action. (laughs) All right. I'm I'm in. I'm in. Every life is good. All is good. We're hard at work. Uh, 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 of course, spreading the word about the John Belushi film and finishing up the Billie Eilish film. So all is all is good. Yeah, let's get into both those. But first, let's start with the uh, Belushi documentary. First of all, fantastic film. Thank uh, you. I really love this. I'm 54. I grew up on Belushi. Belushi is uh, probably the top three reasons I do stand up comedy, although he was not a comedian. Uh, in a stand-up form, he was definitely one of the funniest humans I ever seen and was a huge uh, reason that I loved comedy early on. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm like you, I'm, I'm like 50s. So, uh, so, you know, I was whatever, f- 14 years old when Saturday Night Live premiered. But before that, I somehow my parents let me subscribe to the National Lampoon and um, I listened to the radio hour. So I knew John, I knew his work. I was too young to have seen um, Lemmings, but uh, I certainly saw the ads for it in every month's Nat Lamp. And, uh, and then there they all were on, on Saturday Night Live. It was great. And I always, I, 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 I feel like, and I feel like it comes up a lot in these conversations I've been having in the film that we, we, we related to John in a different way than the others. You know, they were all brilliant. Gilda was brilliant. Bill Murray was, you know, 
such a wise guy and Dan was, you know, that he, he mocked all we held sacred and Chevy was falling all over the place and slapstick always works. But there was something about John that you connected to him as a, like you'd find yourself thinking about him, you know, yeah. <laughs> like between shows. It wasn't just, it was, it was fun. And there was a danger that was, uh, that was, um, hilarious and uh and and radical but also um you know very compelling like you you know like like there was something you liked about that bad boy well it's definitely the number one reason you first get into him is this guy's an outlaw yeah and he's doing something, um, I guess maybe I was in the sixth grade or something when the first season was on, but he's doing some uh, form that I've never even seen. I don't know what sketch is uh, before that. I'm watching sitcoms, of course. Loved All in the Family and that kind of stuff. But this was something totally new to me. And it was uh, 100% this this art form that I was like, oh, I want to do that. And I, I never you know, went on to do Saturday Night Live or sketches or anything, which is really interesting for how much of an impact it had on me. But I did remember being at like sixth grade summer camp and imitating Belushi and doing these sketches and stuff and wanting to be him. Yeah. And you and and he was you say he was an outlaw, but he was like your outlaw. Yeah. You know, he yeah. was an outlaw who was kind of he turned he turned to the side to check with you. You know, as he was, as he was outlawing, <laughs> it was very, it was interesting. And I remember like, I, that's, but so many things drew you to the show, you know, like I remember, you know, just piles of kids gathering at my house the night the dead were on. There was, yeah. a, you know, or, or my brother coming home from college and saying, oh my God, there's this show you got to watch. I was like, dude, I'm watching, you know, yeah. like three weeks in. And, and it, it just was like, it was it was our first kind of thing to hold on to that was uh, the whole world did belong to our parents the whole world was you know was was Huntley Brinkley and Cronkite and you know the past and and this was like the future man oh I mean if you think about like our TV uh, what we had before we discover SNL it's like Sunday, the wa wonderful world of Disney. Right. And, and it's your grandparents watching, um, you know, Lawrence Welk and, and all this real safe stuff. And then you kind of get into all in the family where they're really getting into the politics of the world. And then here comes SNL. And it really turned me on to at the same time comedy, but uh, what I would call New York flavor which I had no mm -hmm. idea being in the Bay area. Mm -hmm, Whoa, mm -hmm. the East coast, this is kind of feels grittier and, and dirty and wild, you know, like just, wow, what is this? And then this whole thing of um, people doing these sketches, like, what is this? And, and at the time I thought the guys were in their thirties, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> because they, mm -hmm. they just seemed way older and stuff. Yeah. And, and you're also learning new music. Uh, Devo was, that's the night I learned Devo. Uh, when Dude, what's on... the first show? Who's on the first show Saturday Night Live? It's George Carlin host. Keep on going. <laughs> Keep on going. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I don't remember the musical act. Who was it? It's Andy Kaufman. Oh, Andy Kaufman. Uh, Come on. I mean, it's George Carlin. Who is yeah. it's a first show SNL. Uh, yeah. Let's see who it is. Huh. It's like, it's Carlin... Yeah. And uh, but that's I, that's my whole point is that it's that you, you've you got a show where it's Carlin hosting and Andy Kaufman is somehow your guest, yeah. you know, and uh, and that's like it, it just is it's it's mind blowing. Yeah, it's and mind they, blowing. They don't it's, even it, know what it is yet. You know, they're right. like like Carlin's doing like uh, comedy in the middle of the show. And, yeah. you know, it's like in the round almost. It's really yeah. bizarre. And he does two or three sets, I right. think, right? Right. I mean, I should know this because we studied all the episodes and we put them, we, you know, but it, it's been a, it's been a year, but um, yeah, it's like, he does multiple appearances. 
Kaufman does his thing. It opens with that insane uh, uh, immigrant sketch yeah. that like you don't really even un- like you got to get the joke. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yeah. it's great. Then Chevy comes on and says live from New York. I don't know. Just as uh, uh, it's it's brilliant, mind blowing for moment one. Anyway, and the spirit of it all, even though he's kind of being held back, right. is John. This is the thing that um, this was my my big revelation very early on was like, holy shit, John's the one who put these people together. Yeah. John knows Harold Ramis before everybody else. John's best friends with Dan Aykroyd. John brings Gilda down from uh, from Toronto. John uh, uh, brings the, the Bill Murray and Brian Doyle Murray to New York. He puts them all together in the cast for uh, the Lampoon Radio Hour. Then Lorne, God bless him, does the hard the stuff that John never could have done, which is get NBC to give him a show, manages Ebersol and those you know, those folks over there deals with the executive structure, gets a show on the air, makes tough decisions and says, I'm the boss. That's hard stuff. John's not going to do that. And I'm not saying John won't do hard things. I'm just saying that's stuff that you need a Lauren Michaels to do. But well, he was John full did, artist. John was full oh, artist, you know. John was full artist. Exactly. Yeah. And what he and he but he, he's not just full artist. He's also director. He's also he he together he and all those guys kind of become this group that's like the it's it's the early days of python it's the early it's it's hamburg with the beatles it's like you know it's the formative years and john's their leader during those formative years amazing amazing you know that's that was really an eye-opener there because when i'm young and i don't understand the dynamics of and i didn't know the backstory of john putting the whole team together but it was interesting when Chevy starts to become the star and John is furious and he's, he's held to this bumblebee sketch. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. of course me being a kid loving that sketch, like the bee, here they are, you know, yeah. and yeah. him going, I don't want to be a fucking bee, you know, yeah, and you right. start watching this going like, I had no idea. And then once Chevy's gone, that's when, when, you know, John goes, okay, this is how it used to be. I'm right. the, the the alpha male. I'm the lead. Right. I'm the ideas. Let's get it on. And yeah, then it and, really and we're, ignites. And, we're, and it ignites. And we're a team. He, it's all, yeah, I mean, totally. it's interesting that Lauren describes it as one for all and all for one because Lauren gets it. Lauren knows what he has. Um, but, you know, it is an interesting dynamic that, you know, two, you've got these two leaders who, you know, have to have to find their way around uh, uh, each other at the beginning. So it's uh, it's fascinating. The other thing that becomes interesting is uh, uh, Belushi hates being a bee and that becomes part of the comedy of the show. Yeah. They do sketches around the fact that he hates being a bee. Yeah. And yep. that's like, so So the meta becomes meta all, uh, and, and, and this again compels you to him as a, he breaks up with Judy, we didn't really, we got into the breakup. There was a, in the longer version of the film, when they split up, you saw the sketches that were done, you know, adopt John Belushi for Christmas because he's got nowhere to go. You know, before he goes out to LA, he's like living lonely in New York and he's depressed because he needs Judy, you know, that's part of the whole thing. And, um, but, but she's, she kicked him out because he's such a dick. And, you, you, but you see that in the comedy of the show, it becomes part of the, the, of course. you know, it's, it's fascinating. It's great. It's great. Those early years, man, they're so rich. And, and um, someone's writing a book about Lauren now, and it's going to be, I'm excited. I'm excited to, yeah. for, for when that comes out, because his perspective on it all, if, if, if the writer really gets to it, it's going to be, you know, it's just going to be fascinating. Well, you could feel for Lauren because he's uh, now has a hit on his hands and now he's dealing with basically the kind of rock star syndrome of is this guy going to show up? How is he going to show up? What the hell am I going to get? Even when Belushi is asked to audition for the show, he's like, I don't fucking do TV. That's back when TV was considered right. garbage and you right. strictly did films or plays. Right. Uh, he even doesn't even want to do the audition. So from the day one, he is uh, a thorn in Lauren's side. 
Well, the, yeah, I think again, because it's these two visionaries who are going to, they're just, they're going to warily circle each other uh, until they find a way. Uh, and, and thank goodness they found a way. But, you know, the other thing I think about is they didn't know at the beginning that the routine was going to be you do three to five, three to five years and then you move on to stardom or your career sinks and a couple of people will stay for seven or eight seasons. That, that's what that's today. You ask somebody, what's the Saturday Night Live thing? Well, a couple of people, you know, explode right away and they're gone in two or three seasons. Uh, the rest of them stay five or six years and they grow on us. So they have they, they become part of the culture and they have uh, careers. Some people just kind of fade away. And then a few of them stay for a long, long time. And we love them for that. That's an SNL cast. They didn't know that. They didn't know what an SNL cast was. They didn't know, like, like there, what were the models? There was, uh, there was SCTV. Yep. There was Python. They, you know, they didn't know who they were going to be. And the Python guys, they stuck it out. They figured out a way to get away from each other when they needed to and get back together to do their work. And they found a way to sustain and and, and thrive over decades, really. Yeah. Um, but the but it's the Beatles and the Stones, you know, the SNL guys just sort of like they no mas. They yeah. they went quickly. I mean, Chevy started that clearly after one season. Uh you get the feeling he was, you know, he was easy, he was easy money for Lauren. But he wasn't what uh, he wasn't what that show really wanted to be. He was just making funny faces. Yeah, you know, yeah, falling, falling down. on his ass. Yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah. loved it though. We loved oh, yeah. it because oh, it was yeah. radical. It was yeah. radical. But you know, but you could feel like he was. You know. Yeah, it wasn't. It was still feel it. Yeah. You still feel it in the film, right? You can yeah. feel he's like, yeah. and there's that picture of John like that. It's, yeah, it's, so cool. it, it's wild to think about when you look at the center of John's demons, it's obviously, which is a lot of, um, I'm, I'm a comedian, so I know the demons and his was the acceptance, uh, from his father, his dad, you know, he just wanted his dad to dig him and yeah. he didn't dig him. And that's where that came from. Yeah. You know, to me, it's a, a kind of, not uncommon immigrant story. And I'm not, you know, and as I, when you talk to Judy and, 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 and Jim has been very kind of, um, you know, he really responded well to the film and I'm so grateful for that. He wasn't really involved in the film, but, but he then, he, he watched it early and he's been very uh, supportive uh, in the wake of the film, you know, being shared with the public and, 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 and this, the more and more I get the sense, which I feel we presented in the film, that he had idea, he had specific ideas, the way immigrant fathers did, the way fathers of that generation did, the way that survivors of the Depression and of World War II did, the way my dad did, that that, you know, this is what you're gonna be. And is this, and he didn't have a lot of time because he was too busy working his fingers to the bones to, you know, provide for his family and keep the restaurants going and do what he could. And, and, uh, and, and so there wasn't a lot of room for understanding your genius child, you know, yeah. there wasn't any, a lot of room to understand that, the, that this kid wasn't going to take over the business you, you built up. Cause, and, and, and for you, why shouldn't like, why should there be time to understand? You worked your, you spent your whole life working to provide for your family, you know, getting getting uh, uh, to America to pursue the American dream. You work your ass off night and day, seven days a week. You know, they, we say he slept in the city. You know, he slept above the restaurant during the week, and then he'd come home. We'd see his kids on the weekends. He, he must have been exhausted. So it's 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 more that. But for the kid, for the genius kid. There's, you know, it's all the law, it's all the absence that you, you know, even if it had been intentional, it wouldn't have been any different, yeah, you know? Yeah, so yeah. it's, it's, it. uh, yeah. And, and, uh, and you do feel, you feel for him, you feel that emptiness for him. And so, uh, and they couldn't reconcile somehow yeah. they couldn't reconcile somehow. Um, John wanted it, you know, I find one of the most poignant parts of the film to be that section where, uh, you know, John finally makes a little bit of money uh, or not finally. And he buys his dad. The first thing Judy says, the first thing we did was buy his parents a ranch. Yeah. So his dad could ride horses like John Wayne. The one thing he wanted was to be, you know, an American cowboy. They buy him a ranch in California so he can 
go riding and it still doesn't really make a difference, you know, in their relationship because what's off is fundamental, you know, and, um, and you, you know, you, you, as I say, you, you, you feel for him uh, as a result, you know, and it's a, it's not a, uh, it's not an uncommon um, story. Uh, I, 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 I was on a panel once with Walter Isaacson, you know, who, who writes all those amazing uh, um, biographies, like he's done Leonardo da Vinci and he did Steve Jobs and he did Ben Franklin. And I was like, dude, what is it? Like, what, what's common? You know, what's yeah. the thing between them all? And he said, oh, it's all about daddy. Exactly. And I was like, exactly. okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, yeah. I, I I seen it right there. I mean, I, yeah. mean I, I've been in it all my life and I'm like, oh, right when it came around, when he said, I don't want the diner life, I went, oh, here we go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we know what's coming here, you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah, my dad couldn't, my dad was a doctor, couldn't understand why I couldn't walk into a hospital. I was like, keep, uh, keep me out. It's, yeah, you, a hospital? <laughs> Not for me, man. Not for me. So sorry. I always thought that the the uh, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger came from that famous uh, outdoor restaurant in Chicago called Wiener Circle. I yeah. swore I thought that was it, but I, yeah. I guess it's from his dad's diner. That's the um, that is the story. Is that uh, that's what Jim Belushi kind of straightens out for us? Is that in fact it was uh, it was based on his dad? We. Um, because other people have said that as well, that they're that the word word on the street was it was the outdoor uh, uh, diner in Chicago. But um, but then you see it and you realize, no way, you know, this is a man who created from his own experience and uh, and shared that. And, and again, it's why we connected to him, I think, so deeply. Uh, and I, I you never seen any like uh, Animal House which, you know, you don't make the animal house doesn't get made in 2020. We know that. Of course. Um, but in whatever year it was, 77, 78, when it does get made, it's about a time that you're, I, by then we, I was 17, 18 years old. And, uh, it's, it's about a time we before us, it's early sixties, but somehow you connect to it. You relate, I mean, you're not in, co I wasn't in college. It wasn't my time period. I didn't know nothing of frat life. I didn't care about it, but there's something about those smart kids, those smart wise ass kids standing up to authority that you just got and you responded to. And they were standing up to those Nazi kids and they were standing up to the, you know, to the bullies and they were standing up to the Dean Wormer and they were, you know, they were breaking all the rules, but they were winking at while they were doing it and their hearts were in the right place and they were taking care of each other. And, you know, so the values were things you somehow they were like the values were really wholesome. You know, it's not as, as much as Belushi's a, a story of a of a tortured artist. It's also, you know, and Judy points this out. It's also the story of a kind of very wholesome Midwestern, you know, high school football playing, just a decent guy who so gathers, you know, gathers his friends with him wherever he goes, is always taking care of his friends, buys a ranch for his dad when he has some, you know, he's like, he's just like a, a good guy. And you feel that, you connect to that. It's a good guy who's also a radical, who's also an anarchist, who also doesn't want to take any shit from the bully or from the or from the, the authoritarian person who's exploiting their power. That's that's a lot of stuff to hold on to. And again, I think why we connected to to John so much then, and why I'm finding in it, and now that this film is out, people still freaking connect to him. It's like. People like us who grew up with him value that connection, but there's a whole couple of generations of people who, you know, are coming out of the woodwork with this film and, and telling me how much he means to them. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite exciting. I got to tell you, one of the great, great things about this film and, um, and same thing with montage of heck, the Cobain film. Yeah. Is this what a terrific film that Brett wow. Morgan's a great filmmaker, smoker, good man. Smoker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the animation in this film really, really does it for me, man. Yeah, but I do want to point out, I want to point something out since you bring up a, a montage of hack. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the graphics, the photos and the letters, yeah. bo in both films, Stefan Nadelman. Oh. And the editor of both films, Joe Beshinovsky. Oh. So two amazing artists, two amazing documentary artists uh, very different in how the, the in and how they manifest in both films, and yet you can see the same you know two artists behind those two things. The animation is different. Our animation right. is Robert Valley, and that is um, another. Th I mean, I'm proud, so proud of the work with on on all those levels, uh, and yet uh, um, uh, Valley's animation, as you say, there's something about it that just like pierces to the essence of who John is. Oh, yeah. it really does, man. When yeah. when he'd zoom in and the eyebrow and just the, the the cold stares sometimes, and you're just looking at it like, holy shit, man, this guy is nailing this with animation, you know? It was drawing me in fierce. Yeah, he got it and he studied John and he obsessed about John and he had thousands of photographs and you know, dozens of hours of material and he just would study them. And, and, you know, there's a wide range. He got that John looked different on different days under different circumstances in different states of sobriety. He got that he, uh, he really got the kid, which, you know, when I saw that kid drawing the first time, first time I saw it, he was knocking on the door of the neighbor going ready to, at three wow. years old, ready to put on a show. And when I saw that, I called up Robert and I was like, dude, we, we got to see that little kid at every stage of his life because it's the same thing. It's all about daddy, but you're always a kid. You're always yeah. that kid yeah. to your father, you know, and in that dynamic that you, that you are forever going to be in. Um, you're always that little boy wanting your dad's approval. So there was that little boy and, he, and there are some places it was super fun, like when he's, you know, dining out on a stranger's refrigerator but other times, like when he's pissed at an interviewer for, for comparing him to Lou Costello or when he's alone in the in the chateau in the final days and you see the little boy there. And that's um, Robert just got that. He got it. It was, it was very exciting. How do you uh, get involved with this project? Was it something you wanted to work on for years? Uh, how does this happen? I got lucky on this one. A, a buddy of mine, uh, John Batsik, who who produced the film with me, uh, he and I had just produced a film about Marlon Brando called "Listen to Me, Marlon." That uh, if you're a Brando fan, check that out. Oh my God! That is uh, that's uh, that's like a that's a trippy film that makes this film look like you know a, a straightforward journey. It's wow. it's a uh, it's like a, it's Br Brando was an obsessive self recorder. And and we we came across the box of tapes wow. from, that had been locked in the storage facility after he died, and it's his whole life from when he's like in his early twenties to the day he dies, and it's 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 acid trips and seductions and rehearsals and phone messages and audio diaries and therapy sessions and on and on and and uh, uh, a, a director named Stephen Riley directed it, it, it's 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 a great film. It's called Listen to Me, Marlon. That's a plug for that. Anyway, Batsik and I were finishing that film and, you know, we had a great time making it together. And he uh, he was like, listen, for I've, I've been trying to get access to John Belushi for the, the you know, to, to permission to do it, access to the archive from his widow, Judy, for a decade. And we've kind of become friends. But every time I reach out to her, she says no. And I just have the feeling, Batsik said, that the timing might be right now. Um, would you be interested in directing? And I, of course, I leapt at it for all the reasons we've been discussing and said, absolutely. And he sent her the Brando film and she called him up and was like, come up to the vineyard, let's hang out. And when we were up at the vineyard, she, I spent a couple of days just like, you know, walking around the island and talking with her and getting to know each other. And then she invited us to check out the archive and which is really just boxes in the basement, but you know, pages of scripts and and uh, and the the audio the the audio that made the film and the letters. I mean, we see the we see the letters, you know, yeah, and and it was all there. It was all just hanging out in the basement. 
Um, so we were like, you know, let's let's make this film. Yeah. Wow, those letters are so deep. Yeah, you know, because it just shows his insecurity and his uh, how vulnerable he was out there when he was on films and yeah. just sad and 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 going through it. You know, yeah. those are yeah. the real the real uh, pulling the heartstrings, you know? Agreed. And they're so, um, you know, he's such a private man and he doesn't, you know, he's private man at a time when celebrities are still, you know, considered entitled to their privacy. It's 19, you know, it's, it's uh, Saturday Night Live is 75. People Magazine doesn't come along till 74. Right. So like, you know, celebrities still had to, could say fuck off. And, uh, and, uh, and he did, he didn't want people prying into his private life, but we got access to his private life through those letters, <laughs> it's, you know, it's and he was very open with Judy and very emotional and very honest and, uh, all the things you were very vulnerable of the things you would, you, you hope as a filmmaker to be able to, you know, bring out and there they were. And then Bill Hader, like, you know, we reached out to his agents. We didn't hear back from his agents for, 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 you know, a couple of months. But when he came in and did the recording, he was like, oh yeah, I said yes the day they called me. Oh. He was like, how could I say, how could I not say yes? It was a chance to, you know, and he, and he doesn't perform Belushi at all. It's still Bill Hader's, you know, he's, but he captures him. He captures his, his, you know, his heart and soul. And uh, and brings the letters uh, to life in a real it, it, what a gift. A lot of people gave on this film. A lot of people just gave. You know, we 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 the movie ends. It's tragic, and 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 I knew we needed something in the credits to to um, you know get us through. And so you've got you've got Belushi doing a little help for my friends. Well, that's Lennon McCartney for closing credits. You know, that's that's how people get rich, <laughs> Ch yeah. char charging for that stuff. And um, and we couldn't afford it. And so I wrote a letter to the to Sir Paul and, um, you know, God bless his his team, his attorney, like called up, you know, two days later and said, it's all yours. You know, wow. I mean, we had to pay a little, but it was fair. Yeah. Use, well, not fair use, but uh, uh, favored nations. We paid them what we paid anybody in the film and we couldn't have made the film without that we couldn't have had that kind of thing but they were an, just an example lauren michaels got arranged for us to have all that snl footage wow uh, oh, uh, as close to free as it can be universal got on board uh we we had an executive producer sean daniel who's just such an amazing guy but he was the executive who green lit um you know who john and dan called with the idea to do the blues brothers movie and he greenlit it on the phone when they called him. And, and he's our executive producer. So he could call people and ask for favors too. And, and as I say, Batsik's like the world's greatest producer. So he, he uh, you know, he's fearless and, and people, people just gave. It was for their love of John, their love of Judy, you know, they gave. So sweet. Was, um, I know that there was, uh, I don't know if this is true. And I wanted to ask you because I had read it years ago. Uh, I don't know if it was in that book. Um, the Belushi one that everybody hates, you know, cause yeah. it's so it's so wrong, but apparently is this true that when they, the day they go to shoot neighbors, John says, I'm playing the other role. Cause I didn't see it in the doc. Yeah. I don't know if it was the day, but there was a switcheroo. There yeah. was definitely like the, the obvious original idea was one. Judy tells that we, that was in a longer version of the film too, yeah. that originally they were going to do it the, the obvious way. And then they got excited about the idea of doing a switch. I don't know that it was the day of, right. Um, uh, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of conflict with the director I mean, we get into that in the film. Of course, yeah. Um, uh, it, it, I, I, you know, there were some extreme stories, uh, as I, as I, I recall. But uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened that day. Um, but I'll tell you that book, the the disappointment that the family had in Woodward's book, uh, Wired. Yeah, was um, was what led them to, uh, what led Judy to do this oral history and interview everybody in John's life within a few years of his death. 
And that those interviews are what we build the film on. So um, the silver lining of that book is, is that we got to make this film and you've got everybody interviewed. First of all, you know, not all of them are with us anymore, but they're telling stories about John's life, you know, with fresh memories of John's life. Oh. They're talking about life. They're not talking about death. They're not talking about something they remember that happened 35 years ago that sucked. They're talking about John Belushi and what it was like to be up there, his, his, his co-worker, his co-creator, his friend, his lover, his everything. And, uh, and, and it's so fresh. It's, it's um, uh, so, and, and we couldn't have done it without, you know, if they obviously, I mean, I didn't, I was stuck before we found those audio tapes. I was like, geez, I'm going to end up with, you know, I don't want to name names, but I had spoken to a couple of people and they were like, old and bitter you yeah. know it was like oh, yeah. too much time had passed yeah. yeah uh or the memories were foggy you know they weren't it wasn't like I, you need it's belushi you know you need it to be like now you need to be raw you need it to be funny you need to be alive and and, and you know think about ramus in that in the in the movie you know he's so present and so connected to john and the essence of who he was and his memories of those experiences Without that stuff, you know, the film is, a, it's a, just a different movie. Well, that's what makes the film, these audio interviews, just tell the whole story. And it's so cool and original. I mean, it opens up with that. Are we rolling? Are we recording? You know, and you're like, oh, this is wild. It's going to be told by these guys. I had no idea that it was just a couple of years after he passed. So that's even cooler because yeah. it's, it's really fresh then. And, and it gives it this it just takes you on this full blown ride. Uh, you know, like, like, like the people are there, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's so good. Very, very present. I wanted to get into a little bit about the, um, of course we know the, the ending he, he overdoses at the Yeah. We all, it, he ends as we all do. Yeah. He yeah. just ends it's too young and too tragically. And, and, and 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 too much the result of you know an an illness a, a, you know he's an addict he's a junkie and uh and, and again in a time when you know we didn't really junkie you know alcoholics had aa but you know the the betty ford clinic opens the year he dies wow yeah wow <laughs> it's not like a thing once you know? that smoky you know, that's like an early on, um, a lot of these people have them now on the sets, these life coaches and stuff to, to help them through, uh, if they're, you know, trying to stay clean and he early on had Smokey and yeah. it was really interesting that he cuts Smokey loose after, you know, a long period of time. He's like, um, no, Smokey cuts himself loose, actually. He's like, hey, yeah. I think you've got this. Yeah. You, you don't need me anymore. And he gets out of there. And then John immediately is like, I don't feel good about this. Smokey's yeah. gone. And then it goes, yeah. you know, it goes south quick. Isn't that yeah. wild? And then, and then Carrie Fisher kind of explains why, yeah. right? Because they, they, there's a fundamental lack of understanding of what, of what they're dealing with. Smokey's a bodyguard. Smokey's a guy who keeps the kid who wants to give John a dime bag or whatever away from John. That's okay. He can do that. He's a big, tough guy. And he's John's bodyguard, you know, again, at a time an early, uh, it's, it's early in the culture of celebrity. So, so Smokey keeps those people away from him, keeps John clean. John's got the vineyard. He goes, you know, he spends better part of a year sober. Why wouldn't everybody think, oh, we got this fixed? He doesn't want to be a junkie. Nope. He's not doing it because he's a bad, you know, because he wants to be bad. He's or, or and he doesn't he doesn't want to destroy his life. He loves his life. You know, yeah, he's he, sick. He, yeah, he's got an illness. He's got a he's 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 an addict. And so, uh, and it's Carrie who, you know, who, who explains to us that, that it's, it's, uh, the, you know, the, the drugs aren't the problem. She says the sobriety is the problem because during the sobriety, you're confronted with your demons. Now, if you don't know how to confront those demons, if you don't have the tools, if you don't have the support, if you don't, you know, you, you need help. 
um, then you're going to, then they're going to beat you. They're going to eat you alive. And that's what happened. That's just flat out what happened to him. You can't blame Smokey because he's not trained in that area at all. Right. You know, and you can't blame Judy because it's all new. It's like, you can't blame anybody. You can't blame, there's no, it's like, it's just sucks. <laughs> yeah, it does but suck. there's a lot to learn from it. There's a lot to learn from it. And, and it is the story of what happened. The one piece of film that isn't in the, in the in our movie that that we tried to get in, but it's so long, and it, which yeah. is that amazing um, a black and white film uh, where John visits the graves of all the of all the SNL original prime not ready for prime time players, oh. and he goes, he's old man John Belushi, and he <laughs> takes the train. It's snowing out. Yeah. And he takes the train up to up to the wherever the graveyard is, and he gets off the train. And he goes and he visits them, and he talks about how this one died, and this one died. You know, a, 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 you know, he he gets he gets his, uh, he, he, you know, he gets even with it with Chevy, and he get and he's you know he's a couple snide comments and. Um, and uh, and then he, he lays a re, uh, you know, the flowers he's brought at uh, at, at Dan Aykroyd's uh, grave site. And he says, you know, they all said I'd be the first to go, but I outlived them all. You want to know what my secret is? And the camera pulls back and he throws his cane down and he says, I'm a dancer. And he just starts dancing. And it's like, and you, you, you feel in that from that, you know, this was not someone who, who ever wanted, uh, was attracted to the to the d demons and destruction. It was not a death wish that he was on. It, he it was it was almost the opposite. It was he was so in love with life he couldn't stop himself. And because he was also an addict, it was gonna it was gonna take him to the to the darkest places. And um, and that's a shame. But that movie's like eight minutes long. And even you know if we cut it down to five minutes, it's. You know, five minutes is a lot in a film like this. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's it's worth it's if if if, if for people who see our film and and want to see one more piece about John Belushi. Of course, the movies should be seen uh, in the old Saturday Night Live sketches, but this film, uh, The Graveyard, uh, John going to the graveyard is pretty special. So you're working on a Billy Eilish documentary, huh? I am. I am. We're finishing it up. I, we're, we're not really talking about it, but um, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're, it's coming out in February wow. uh, on Apple TV Plus and in uh, in movie theaters. And I'm, I'm, I'm really psyched. I'm really psyched. She's uh, she's special in every way. And, and so is her family. And um, we were given access for a year and um, and we're just really proud of the film. Just hanging out up there at Highland Park. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed the September issue. Uh, oh, thanks. Well, that's another just massive icon. You know? Anna, yes. Yeah. Um, you have a lot of great work, man. You've, you, you did a, a hell of a job on this film. I absolutely loved it. And uh, what, a, what, a, what a great, great movie. Where can people see this right now? Showtime, watch it on Showtime, stream it, uh, you know, that you can, you can buy Showtime for, a, you know, I'm sure there's a free 30 day period, everybody's got them, but you can get it through any service that get, that'll get you to Showtime, or you can go to showtime.show.com, uh, I think is what it is, or just click on anything Showtime, Google anything called Showtime, stream it or watch it on your TV, they're showing it a lot, and, um, and yeah, check it out. Yeah, oh, man. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Yeah, it's fun. It was really, really good to uh, talk to you. And like I said, what a great, great film, man. And and to see that guy's life before SNL was really, really interesting to me. The early, early days and that stuff of, uh, you know, going to uh, Groundlings and going, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. That kind of stuff really just fires me up. You know, Sweet. Sweet. I love it. I'm so glad. Yeah. So glad. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Pleasure to chat. Yes. Awesome. And looking forward to that. Come back on the show when the uh, Billy pod, uh, Billy docs out. I, I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, I can't yeah. wait. I want to talk about it. Yeah. Let's do <laughs> right. that. Let's do Good. that for I, sure. I look forward to it. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, pal. Yeah. See you.